Good morning. My name's David Robert Shaw, and I think I'm the only person in here wearing a necktie. <laughs> but this is because this is in honor of our speaker. I thought I'd better be formally dressed because I had to introduce him. Uh, our speaker today uh, is uh, Dr. Mawia Babasanji. Um, he received his uh, BA degree from Damascus University in Syria and his master's from the University of Minnesota. He joined the research staff of the Department of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences here at Cornell and he is currently a professor emeritus of that department. And he joined them as a research associate immediately after completing his PhD in seismology at Columbia University in 1971. During the period from 19, November 1978 to June 1980, he was a professor and chairman of the Department of Geophysics at King, uh, King Abdul Aziz University in Jeddah, South, uh, Saudi Arabia. He was a senior scientist at Cornell when, in 1998, he was appointed a professor. He also served as the associate director of the Institute for the Study of the Continents at Cornell from 1998 to 2010. <coughs> professor Barazanji is a member of the American Geophysical Union, the Seismological Society of America, and the Geological Society of America. The title of his talk today is The Arab Winter, Oil, Wealth, and Declining Science. I'm hoping that there might be an exception to the declining science that uh, exists in that part of the world, but that's me speaking personally. <laughs> Professor Bellis Angel. Thank you. If I know you're going to have a tie, I would have put my tie, but, <laughs> but anyway, it's a good morning and salam alaikum. I thank especially Cindy and Judith for making this lecture possible, and I thank the audience for coming. I'm sorry to inform you from the start that my presentation will be a sad one but very realistic and frank. <clears throat> and I hope that I will not unnecessarily depress you this morning. This lecture will not be a traditional, typical one, and it addresses two major subjects, Arab oil and wealth and its relation to the United States, and second, the unfortunate decline of both science and human development in the Arab world. The lecture will include scientific information and facts and suggested strategies and future policies. You will not find the information that I will present in a single publication. And most probably, you will not agree about part of this presentation. This is OK. I will use a very limited number of PowerPoint slides the lecture will last about one hour. I think it's going to be about 50 minutes, and we'll be glad to answer questions at the end. <clears throat> Let me say a few words about the sources that I used concerning the oil <clears throat> and wealth subject. I used many scientific journals, numerous publications, and summary reports from many agencies like USGS, US Energy Information Administration, International Energy Agency, and many others, and from national and international oil companies. In addition, my personal contact and interaction with exploration managers for the Middle East of many international oil companies as part of my industrial associate program for many years here at Cornell. Concerning science and development in the Arab world, I use again numerous reports and publications from numerous sources. I will not list here now. It, uh, there are too many. 
But as important, my experience and knowledge working for about 30 years in the scientific research project in many of the Arab countries. Most of the authoritative studies, especially the one from UNDP and UNESCO, concerning science in the Arab region depends and based on statistical information from many sources, including Arab government, private foundation, and other sources. But most of it, if not all, do not give the real picture of science on the ground, mainly because they lack ground truths of direct continuous interaction over many years with scientists, both young scientists and mature, and administrators and policymakers in those countries. And this is my strength for dealing with such people for many years in many Arab countries, including Morocco, Algeria, Egypt, Yemen, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Oman, Kuwait, Jordan, Syria, and Lebanon. You may ask why I entitled my lecture The Arab Winter. Because it is the truth. There was and there is no Arab Spring for decades, and really for centuries. It is an inv invention mostly by the media. If you want, you may call it a few candles of light, but in a sea, a sea of darkness. Now I will focus on two main subjects concerning the Arab region, oil and science. Oil and natural gas, the main strategic natural resource in the Arab region, represents the Arab material wealth. And clearly the West, that is Western Europe and the USA especially, has a lot of interest in its production, management, and its control. What about science? Ideally, wealth should be used wisely, especially in a human development, in order to create a new knowledge and innovation in all spheres of life. And this is where there is a major failure in the Arab region. I start with a very brief summary of this presentation. I'll give you three major conclusions at the beginning. First, the Arabian Persian Gulf region, I will call it the Gulf, to avoid argument, whether Persian or Arabian, is the site of the largest proven reserve of conventional oil in the world and will continue to be the case most probably for the rest of this century. There is another Middle East to be discovered in the present Middle East, and I will explain why. Second, in spite of the extreme wealth of the Arab countries in the Gulf, in the Gulf really extreme wealth, and that's not including Iran. I'm mentioning the Arab countries, not including Iran. For example, the income from oil and gas in 2012, last year, was about $750 billion. And the surpl surpluses of rich Arab countries, the extra money they have, is currently about $3 trillion. T, like in town, $3 trillion. In spite of this wealth, and recognizing the many recent scientific initiatives during the recent past two, two to three decades, especially in rich Arab countries, and I will explain, there is a definitive, definite ongoing decline in science in all the Arab countries. And there is a major crisis in the Arab human development, and there is no hope for a remedy in the near future. Third, Islam as a religion and a world view is not the cause of this problem. Islam is based on two main sources, the Quran and the prophetic tradition. We call it Hadith. I argue that the narrow interpretation of the Quran and the misuse of the Hadith over many centuries have significantly contributed to the problem. There is an urgent need to reread the Quran 
and to rethink the hadith in an open mind and open heart. This must be done. And my wife, Namath here, is doing research work and writing another book on the subject. But there are very few scholars who are directly addressing these two issues. Let me discuss the oil and wealth part of the presentation. To better appreciate the oil story in the Gulf, that is, the Gulf in the Middle East, it is important to first briefly discuss the global picture with special focus on the USA. Recently, that is June, last June, 2013, the world oil demand averaged about 89 million barrel per, of oil per day. You should remember this figure. We need about 90 million barrel of oil per day for the whole world. Now, the world population, as you know, will increase from about the current 7 billion, about 7 billion people, to about 9 billion people, uh, the best estimate project in 2035. This will result in a major energy demand, especially oil, coal, and gas. And the best projection is that oil demand will reach 110 million barrel per day by the year 2035. This is based on our Department of Energy projection. What are the sources of world oil? You say, OK, where are we getting our uh, uh, energy, world energy? As of June 2013, a few months ago, 33% come from oil. And the lowest, lowest on record, oil has lost market share for 13, year, 13 years in a row. That's good. But 33% still come from oil, 30% from coal, and the highest since 1970, more usage of coal, and 24% 24, 24 natural gas. So oil, coal, and natural gas add up to 87% of the world usage of energy. 7% 7, 7 come from hydroelectric, and 4.5% from nuclear. And, there, and only 1.5%, 1.5% from all other renewable energy, name it, uh, solar, wind, geothermal, biofuel, only 1.5%, very small number. I will give you some facts about the USA. Recently, the USA, we need about 20 and a half million barrel of oil per day to run this country. 10 and a half million barrel is from domestic production, and including Alaska and Gulf of Mexico, and 10 million barrel imported. It's about 50-50. Note that the USA, we are only about 5% world population using about 23% of, uh, <coughs> of world oil supply. Also note that the USA made about 25% increase in oil production in 2012. Very dramatic. This is very large increase and this increase is mainly due to unconventional oil production using the technique so-called fracking, hydraulic <coughs> fracturing. And I will explain a little more. The question that you hear a lot lately is, will the USA become energy independent? Of course, the USA has a large supply of coal, very large. But what about oil and gas? The unconventional tight oil, they call it tight oil, of the USA is located, most of it, 80% of the tight oil of the USA, in two areas, really. One in so-called Bakken Formation, North Dakota and Eastern Montana, the Williston Basin. And the other is the Eagle Ford Formation in South Texas, only those two regions. 80% of the tight oil in the USA. Total production from tight oil now in the USA about 2 million barrel per day. But it is based on hydraulic fracturing, as I said. 
technology and horizontal drilling. In the back end area, <coughs> the current drilling rate, they drill 1,500 wells a year. <laughs> Incredible. And they produce about 1 million barrel a day from Dakotas. And remember, it costs about $10 million per well to drill. So it's not cheap. So far, they have about 5,000 oil wells in the Williston Basin that, uh, for this unconventional oil. <laughs> Looks like Swiss cheese. Some of you have seen some photos. They are incredible to see. The price of oil must be, however, more than about $80 per barrel to make it profitable. Oil production from tight oil plays will continue to rise, leading to a considerable reduction in net import dependence. But for sure, we will continue to import oil at a reduced rate. Note that crude oil production has increased in, since 2008, reversing decline that began in 1986. In 86, we start importing more. In 2008, we start importing less. How about natural gas? Most of you, if not all of you, are aware that we are in the midst of a shale gas revolution. And regardless of your personal feeling about it, shale gas was only count to 2% of USA pr gas production in the year 2000. And now it's about 40%. In 2012, was 40% coming from shale gas. And it, it distributed more in the USA, five areas. We call it five plays, five areas. 80% come from those five areas. One of them is in our neighborhood, the Marcellus Shale region in New York, Pennsylvania, Ohio, and West, in West Virginia. And there are other areas in Arkansas, and Oklahoma, and Texas. But very large number of wells must be drilled. For example, in Louisiana, they drill about 800 wells per year for the shale gas. Increase of natural gas will continue from tight shale formation, whether we like it or not, and projected to outpace domestic consumption by the year 2020, and will result in possible exporting natural gas though you can argue about the rationale and the logic of this decision. In summary, energy independence for USA is very likely for natural gas, is very unlikely for oil, and especially if restrictions on exploration are continue to be enforced. And I hope they will continue to be enforced. Again, I leave this for question and answer in case people you want more, know more. You may ask, where on Earth the majority of conventional oil exists on this Earth? In seven countries. <clears throat> Five in the Gulf region, that is Saudi Arabia, Iraq, <clears throat> Kuwait, United Arab Emirates, and Iran. Four of them Arab, one Persian, but all Islamic and the other two countries, Venezuela and Russia. That count up, as I said, to 80% of all the proven reserve of the whole world. Canada can be in this club if we consider the unconventional reserve. They have a huge reserve, unconventional. And they now they're producing about from the sand, uh, <coughs> from the tar sand, about two million barrel per day in Canada. It's uh, environmentally, it's very nasty, but they are producing it. And if the USA give permit to the Keystone Pipeline from Canada to the USA, Canada is, is hoping to increase production to 6 million barrel per day from the tar sand by the year 2035. And that could be a problem for the environment, needless to say. You may ask, so those seven countries I mentioned, 
have 80% of the all the world reserve for oil. For gas, five countries have most reserve, Russia, Iran, Qatar, USA, and Saudi Arabia. Let me repeat, Russia, Iran, Qatar, USA, and Saudi Arabia. Six, more than 60% of world proven conventional oil reserve exist in the Gulf region, the Arabian Persian Gulf region, more than 60%. The only they produce 25% of the world supply. Only produce 25% world supply, but they have much more reserve. So Saudi Arabia is producing about 11 million barrels per day. It's the largest in the world. And second to Saudi Arabia, there's Russia and the United States with about two and a half, 10 and a half uh, million barrel per day production. Aramco, the Saudi national oil company, claims that their current capacity is 12 and a half million barrel per day. So they are able to produce more Saudi Arabia if there is need. However, these figures are not static and it is constantly changing because of improved te new technology, such as horizontal drilling, fracking, increase oil recovery. This is very important. They are really doing major increase in recovery. Traditionally, they only extract about 35% of the oil underground, but new technology allowing to go up to maybe 50% and Aramco dreaming dreaming making it as much as 70%, which will dramatically increase the total budget. Why so much oil in the Gulf region? Because of exceptional and optimal geologic condition, and I will stop here. Otherwise, I will put you to sleep if I start explaining the geology about why the oil there. Let me show you I cannot resist, since I came from plate tectonics, show you a slide of plate tectonics and uh, all the plate on Earth, but we're talking about this region, especially the Gulf region here. And this is a very simplified map, tectonic map of the Middle East area here, showing Saudi Arabia and the active volcanism here in Western in Saudi Arabia and Syria and Turkey. But this is the Zagros Fault Belt, separating Arabia from Iran, the collision belt. And the Gulf really here is very shallow water. The deepest about 100 meters. A lot of the Gulf region is about 20, 30 meters. And during glacial time, people must be able to walk across here. So it's very shallow water here in the Gulf. This, the green showing the a very brief summary of the oil, oil field, and the red, the gas field. Let me provide you now with some information that may help you understand. One of the reason, understand, one of the reason why the United States went and invaded and occupied Iraq. And we have, and we certainly have a massive military presence in all the Gulf region, all the countries, except of course Iran. And you can say why Iran and always nervous. They have American military bases all the way from the north and the east, all the Arabian region here. The Gulf region has 30 Super giant oil field, 3 0, 30. Super giant field like this one or like this one, we define it as have more than 5 billion barrel of reserve, proven reserve. And the whole, and there's about 80 giant oil fields. So I define super giant field, and there are 80 giant oil fields that have reserve between half a billion and five billion barrel of oil. There's only total here about 600 oil field. For comparison, the United States, we have more than 30,000 oil field. Let me explain, example, Romela, this Romela oil field, mostly in Iraq, 
the southern part of it in Kuwait. And this is one of the things that really irritated Saddam Hussein because uh, the, uh, the, the Kuwaiti will drill here and go horizontally trying to tap the oil. And uh, discovered in 1953, this super giant oil field, this one here, Romela, has more proven reserve than all of the conventional proven reserve of the whole United States, including Alaska and Gulf of Mexico. The conventional top, one oil field. This Gawar, Gawar oil field in Saudi Arabia is the largest in the world. It's about 250 kilometer in length, about 20 kilometer in width and uh, uh, discovered in 1948 and produces 5 million barrels of oil per day. Incredible. Note that it is considerably much cheaper to drill and produce oil in the Gulf region. It costs only about 5 to $10 million to drill a well on land in this part of the world. In contrast, some of the deep water wells, deep water wells, uh, it costs as much as one billion dollar. Huge difference. The end result, it costs really about five dollars to produce one barrel of oil in the Gulf region and costs more than 40 dollars per barrel uh, in Canada or the U USA for unconventional oil. The question for us, Will the oil production soon decline in the Gulf region? The concept of peak oil mean, uh, will the concept of peak oil mean the end of oil, as proposed and suggested by some recently published books? The simple answer is no. The proven recoverable oil reserve in the Gulf region is huge and reasonably well documented. It's about 270 billion barrels in Saudi Arabia and 150 billion barrels in Iraq and Iran and about 100 billion barrels in Kuwait, the United Arab Emirates. There is, will be oil from this region on current production for at least 50 years, if not 100 years. In fact, there is a need for a considerable more exploration and drilling in the Gulf region, especially in Saudi Arabia, Iraq, and Iran. Only two to 300 wells per year are drilled for the whole Gulf region. Two to 300 wells, relatively nothing. Versus, remember, in the USA, we drill about 30,000 wells per year for, so they, we don't know much about this region, really. And the Paleozoic play, in geology we call some uh, uh, age Paleozoic, the older type rocks, they discover in the empty quarters, on the margin of the empty quarter, and uh, there's potential for much more. The empty quarter, really, the size of Texas is hardly explored for logistical reason, and there is no need for Saudi to explore right now. Iraq and Iran have little modern exploration for the past 30 years for obvious reasons. Wars and boycott and sanctions. The whole Mesopotamian four deep, really, this Mesopotamian four deep that continue into Iraq, most probably underlain by oil, including Baghdad. And certainly Western Iraq, <coughs> this is a map showing the oil in Syria, and you see all the oil stop on the political boundary. This is, of course, not, doesn't make sense. The geologic, geologic structure in Western Iraq, for sure there will be oil. <clears throat> I finish from the slide issue here. In fact, recently OPEC estimated 200 billion barrels of oil not yet discovered in the Gulf region, a future Middle East inside the Middle East. That's why I said there is a Middle East inside the Middle East to be discovered yet. Only Russia has such a possibility. 
in West Siberia and the Arctic region, but as you know, it is very difficult logistically and politically. <clears throat> Let me remind you that, <clears throat> that the whole world so far, we used about one trillion barrel of oil from ground zero until now, about one trillion barrel of oil. And the best estimate and projection is that there are still about two trillion, two trillion barrel of proven and recoverable reserve. And could be more if you factor in the unconventional reserve as I have discussed. Of course, this does not include, does not include offshore exploration possibilities like what they're doing right now, both in shallow and deep water. They're doing now a lot of exploration in West Africa, offshore like Liberia, Sierra Leone, Ghana, and Nigeria. Remember, we are not doing the world yet, not going big time offshore because of environmental concern. <clears throat> and of course, the promising possibility of increased oil recovery to double the amount that can be produced from underground. Let me reflect a few words about the subject of wealth in the Arab Gulf country. The Arab Gulf countries, not Iran, was a target price of about $100 per barrel of oil. That's what it is now, a little more right now, one, more than $100 per barrel. Saudi Arabia yearly income is little more than $360 billion per year. Incredible. That is $1 billion per day. And Iraq and Kuwait and the United Arab Emirates, about $100 billion <clears throat> per year. And Qatar, in 2012, their income from mostly natural gas was $190 billion, $190 billion Qatar. Uh, that's little country. Indeed, the Arab Gulf, not including Iran, recorded total oil and gas income last year, 2012, of $750 billion. $750 billion last year income for only the Arab countries, not Iran. This is the highest income in history. It was only $300 billion in 2005, 2006, mainly because of more oil production and high price of oil. Last year, the average oil price was $110 per barrel. Is it wise for the Arab, especially Saudi Arabia, to maintain and plan to increase current production of oil? The, the minister of oil in Saudi Arabia mentioned in a speech last year that they are projecting to go as much as 15 million barrel production per day. That would be tragedy. All Arab government say yes. I argue that the answer could be no. Geologically, may not be good to accelerate production. Economically, economically, no need for their extra money now, considering their development plan. And socially and politically, they should consider future long-term gen generations. And we, they are really helping the West, especially the United States, to maintain our addiction to oil. For, exa for example, I'll give you an example how we're wasting money. They are wasting money. Considerable sum of petrodollars in the billion are spent on wasteful, really silly project, such as the highest building on earth in the United Arab Emirates and destroying the Gulf ecosystem by claiming the Gulf water to create artificial island to build houses in the United Arab Emirates. This is tragedy, as if every Bedouin must open their door and find water in front of their door, destroying the ecosystem. And not to mention building, yes, building a downhill skiing slope in Dubai. Yeah, skiing slope in Dubai. This is really uh, decadence, I, I should say. And of course, purchasing much weapons, especially from the USA. Saudi Arabia spent last year 
$60 billion on buying 150 fighter jets. And, and, and I will reflect on that later. By the way, United States, is the, uh, they sell 75 percent of all the uh, world weapons and more. To, fa to further understand the keen and strong interest of the West, especially the USA, not only to access the oil resources of the Gulf region, but also to access the future wells of the region, let me mention here a recent economic study by the late Professor Chapman here at Cornell. He estimated the total value of known proven reserve, the proven reserve in the Gulf region, to be about $150 trillion, 150 trillion with the letter T like a Tom. Assuming an average price of $100 per barrel, which currently is, the question is who will control this wealth? The USA is in full harmony with all these undemocratic, let me emphasize, undemocratic countries in the Gulf. Why not also Iran? You may see the anxiety of the USA about Iran. Let me now discuss the current and future of scientific research in the Arab region. Is there a hope? I will explain why my answer was no, at least for the near future. The fundamental problem, in my opinion, is that first, that the human development in the Arab region is primarily based on individual initiative and not on organized, well-developed system of values and societal infrastructure. Second, the misuse and the misinterpretation of the two primary sources of Islam. Let me make very clear. I'm saying the misuse and the misinterpretation of those sources, that is the Quran and the collection of the Prophet Muhammad saying and tradition, I call it hadith, have significantly contributed to minimize innovation on all individual and society level, individual and society level, and, all, and on all spheres of life, including science and especially women development. It is a cultural crisis that is in the making for hundreds of years. It's nothing new. The crisis is very deep and extremely serious, but is denied, ignored, and often not discussed. Let me shed some light on the decline of science in the Arab region by stating two major misconceptions. First, science could be transferred without major planning and building a strong infrastructure for research and providing the required human development. And second, that basic research is dispensable for financial reason. The Arabs must understand that leapfrog, the development cycle does not work. You cannot buy or import science, as they're doing, say, in Qatar and other countries in the Gulf region. How can I say this with so many university graduate and considerable expenditure on scientific institution and center. You know, you hear in the news a lot of things happening. For example, there's about 140,000 Saudi students are studying abroad. Large number, mostly in the USA. And this is going on for many years. But at the same time, about one third, one third of Saudi young people are jobless. It's not working. In fact, youth unemployment in Arab countries is double the global average. In Egypt, 25% of university graduates are unemployed. Let me mention an example, which is, I call them the candle of light. Three multi-billion dollar regional initiative in the Arab rich countries exemplify recent top-down <coughs> uh, uh, approach to higher education, uh, but though they will brain drain other 
poor Arab countries. The first one, the Qatar Education City, established 2001, involving six large U.S. universities, including Cornell. And uh, second, the Masdar Institute in Abu Dhabi, established 2006, involving big time MIT. And the third, King Abdullah University of Science and Technology, established 2009. It's really an international university implemented by Aramco and other USA scholars. These are some of the candles of light, but their impact on human development in the Arab region is really minimum and marginal, especially considering the magnitude of resources they have used. It's differently okay to build such institution better than purchasing stupid weapons, but, but they are not the answer to the human development problem. And I, if there is a question and answer later, I certainly have a lot of concern about Cornell partnership with Qatar, and I'll be glad to elaborate if people would like to hear different opinion. Let me provide you with some more facts about the Arab region. Currently, there's about 360 million people in the Arab world, 360, little more than the USA. Their projection to be 400 in 2020 and the best estimate, 600 million Arab in 2050. This is really the coming catastrophe. Remember, in 1980, there was only 150 million Arabs, only. Why, why is this situation? Because 60% of Arabs under the age of 25, and more than 30% under the age of 15. There are 65 million Arabs illiterate, and two-thirds of them are women. Let me give you another fact which is striking. Arab countries, collectively, all of them, the poor and the rich, the 22 Arab countries, spend 0.15, 0 0.15% of their collective GDP gross domestic product on science, scientific research and development. That is, the Arab states spend about $10 per person per year. Of course, on scientific research in the United States or Europe, they average six to $700 per person per year. And the global average for spending on research and development is 1.5% of GDP. 1.5%. The Arab spending 0.15, 10 times less. Of special interest here, I should say, the super rich countries of the Gulf, Saudi Arabia spend only 0.05% of their GDP. It's really a shame, Consider relative to their GDP, of course and Kuwait 0.09, and Qatar 0.33, though they claim they're going to increase it. In contrast, to make you feel what Israel spent 4.4% of their GDP on science, one of the highest in the world. And for reference again, the USA, we spend about 2.7%, and South Korea, 2.4%. Only seven Arab countries out of the 22 have a national academy of sciences, and most have no national science policy. Let me give you an interesting example. The recent Muslim Brotherhood administration, the one they are in jail right now, in Egypt declared an Islamist science policy last year that has three goals. The first goal, support national defense and security. That's okay. Second, ensuring quality of life. That's okay. Third, proving the miraculous nature of the Islamic faith. This is indeed a surprising goal, and Quran should not be viewed as a scientific book. Let me give you other fact. The military expense, that's where Arabs excel. 
The military expenditure of the Arab countries as a percentage of GDP is the highest ratio in the world. The Arabs are really good customer of the USA. Saudi Arabia spent 10% of their GDP on military, Kuwait 7%, Oman 12%. In fact, if you combine all everything the Arab spent on science and development and technology, and everything they spend on education, all level of education, university, uh, K-12, and everything, and most of it, by the way, uh, government uh, uh, education system, and everything they spend on health, all aspect of health, the three together, they spend more money on military per year. As I said last year, the Saudi purchase $60 billion of fighter jets from USA. And three years before that, they purchased $20 billion from the United Kingdom. And that's when they, the big fiasco, probably you heard about this uh, Prince Bender, who is now the head of security of Saudi Arabia, who been, uh, uh, made a cut for himself $2 billion. And the British government, after they admitted it, you don't hear much about it. He made $2 billion himself, personally, for that deal with the United Kingdom. This, of course, has a lot of implication about the industrial military complex here in the United States. Another aspect of the Arab world, oil consumption in Arab countries, 2012, only 7 million barrels per day. <laughs> Very low. This is really. Uh, sign of lack of industrialization and development. Saudi Arabia, energy consumption, they, they use 28% of all the total Arab consumption because of the waste, the way they, they use energy. There are only 25, 30 million people in Saudi Arabia, but they use 28% of all the 360 million uh, people in, of Arabs. Air pollution in Arab countries, except the mega cities, is among the lowest in the world. Again, not much industrialization. Uh, basically, they are import consumer societies. Qatar, by the way, I just want to say, since our colleague here was teaching in Qatar, leads the world in, leads the world in per person CO2 emission. <laughs> this is very wasteful, many country. It's the highest. It is outlier. Nothing come close to Qatar in terms of wasting energy. Another example, all Arab countries only produce authored and translated in 2010, 6,000 books in science and technology. In the United States, we, they, we produce more than 100,000 book for that year. In general, book production in Arab country is 1% of world production, though the Arab constitute 5% of world population. And most published books are centered on religious subject. If you take that out, there's really, the story is even more sad. Lack of innovation is evident by the very limited published scientific paper and evident the number of patents that are registered. For example, between 1980 and 2000, 20 years, a total of 500 Arab patents only, compared to 8,000 for Israel for the same period of time. Also in 2008, only 70, 71 patents registered by Arabs and some are by expatriates working, non-Arab working in Arab, uh, Arab university. Concerning published scientific paper, the number is extremely low. is as low as two papers per 100 researcher. It's trivial. Another challenge for the Arab country, I should mention here, the brain drain. One third of the total brain drain, brain drain from developing countries to the West are Arabs, one third. Arab countries lose one half 
of their newly qualified medical doctor. Incredible. And one quarter of their engineers and 20% of their scientists, I guess including myself, per year to the West. And three quarter of those my uh, Arabs who leave come really, three quarter of them come to the USA, England, and Canada. Why brain drain? Because of low salaries, lack of opportunity of scientific research, limited new technology, lack of freedom, and prevailing political and social instability. The majority, if not all, of Arab universities are at best center for knowledge dissemination and not for new knowledge production and innovation. There are only about 250 public and private universities in the Arab region in 2010, total, the whole Arab countries. And about 300 scientific research center and organization, mostly outside the university and mostly governmental center, and mostly they, they uh, specialize in agriculture and some in water resources. All of the above suffer from lack of innovative leadership and as well as much needed environment, environment to allow for development of leadership. Let me give you an example of how two Saudi universities have recently misused and abused of science, integrity, and trust. I'm not trying to pick on Saudi Arabia, but it's a good example to, to mention. King Saud University in Riyadh, Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, and King Abdulaziz University in Jeddah, I used to teach there for one year and a half, long time ago, are wrong, are wrong by appointing USA and European Canadian well-known and accomplished scientists, these are Nobel laureate type, as adjunct professors and grant them a lot of cash between 50 to $100,000 per year per scientist to gain visibility in research journal by adding the Saudi university, by adding to the Saudi university addresses on their published paper. They will say Harvard address and then and King Saudi University in order to get credit on ISI highly cited list. This is sponsored and supported by Saudi Ministry of Higher Education, though they deny it, but it, it, uh, I know from personal colleague in Saudi Arabia, it, it did happen. Of course, it is also very wrong for the USA, Canadian, European scientists from Harvard, Cambridge, University of Toronto, and so on, to agree to be partner for such a deal. I call it a Mickey Mouse deal. Again, this is an example of buying and importing science rather than producing it. For your information, the 2011 Shanghai ranking of top 500 world university include only three Arab universities. In Israel, I think they have seven or eight universities, the top 500, but all the Arab countries have three, King Saud University, King Fahd, and Cairo University. I can understand Cairo University, but King Saud University, it looks as if the adjunct appointment scenario work well for them. They used to be ranked 2,900, and they jump <laughs> after that to the upper 500. The recent Arab Human Development Report emphasized three major def def deficits, really in the Arab world, freedom, women rights, and knowledge. The question is why the Arabs evolved from the house of wisdom. This is the name of the institution uh, in Baghdad in the 9th and, uh, and 10th century, from the house of wisdom to the present house of darkness. Remember, and, uh, the house of wisdom used to have 400,000 books in, in, in the uh, 9th and, and 10th century, actually. The institution of the house of wisdom and Al-Azhar University in Cairo were the first global residential university before the establishment of Bologna in Italy and Oxford and Cambridge in England. 
during the golden age of Arab Muslim sciences, between 900, say, and 1200, it was achieved in a, tol a tolerant, intellectual, though religious atmosphere, but quite independent of religious authorities. Let me state here again that Islam is not the problem in achieving higher science in the Arab region. However, the evolving practice of Islam failed to offer a way to institutionalize free inquiry. Even though the concept of a university started in the Arab Islamic world. And again, the misuse of the prophetic tradition, the Hadith, has significantly contributed to the sad descending status of Muslim women. Finally, let me again say a few words concerning the wealth in the Arab region. The surpluses of rich Arab countries, the surpluses, is currently estimated about $3 trillion. Tila like Kentan, $3 trillion. Most of it is sitting on wealth fund or foreign currency reserve a lot of it in the USA. Only about $30 billion, only $30 billion are used collectively by the Arab Gulf countries outside these rich countries, mostly in Arab, other Arab countries and Muslim countries, and mostly in giant property development and especially tourist destination, such as the one Red Sea and the Eastern Mediterranean and very, very few dollars, that is only in the millions of dollars, on human development, the human development project and infrastructure, such as university know-how transfer and professional training and education. You may ask, how about the rich Arab individuals? If those are the countries, what about the rich Arab individual? Here are some facts. There are about 4,000 identified people in the Arab Gulf region with wealth, with wealth more than $30 million per individual. The total wealth of these individuals is about $730 billion. For example, in Saudi Arabia, there are 1,265 individuals with total wealth of $230 billion. Of course, that includes many from the royal family. In, in Kuwait, there are 735 individuals with 125 billion. Indeed, this is a huge wealth, both for the countries and individuals, but where is the Bill Gates of the Arabs? There is no Bill Gates in the Arab land. Yes, they do give gifts and grants here and there, but it is always in the millions of dollars, in the millions of dollars, and many of it to build mosques, and more mosques, and often with their names on it, on the mosque. We honestly ha have enough mosques in the Arab world, but the Arabs need massive investment in the development of the Arab mind. And finally, let me summarize by saying that the much needed Arab cultural and scientific renaissance requires a new governing state system, new strategy, new policy, a new education environment in order to liberate the human capabilities and potential. And since this is not possible in the near future, hence my answer to my question was no. It is of interest to note here that the well-known Arab American scientist, Egyptian by origin, Dr. Ahmed Zouel at Caltech, a Nobel laureate and U.S. science envoy by President Obama recently wrote two papers in 2011 in which he emphasized that the core problem, in his opinion, is the backward education system and that politics and religion must not interfere in education. This is correct, though I think that the problem is considerably more complicated and requires the restructuring of the Arab mind. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very provocative. Um, we have uh, no more than 10 minutes for questions as we need to be out of here uh, at uh, 1140. So, uh, it's open. There we go. Tony. 
just a matter of the production of books, for example, in the Arab world. That is, the demand for books follows on the level of literacy in the general population. So what is the level of literacy in the Arab world at the moment? And is it static? Or is it declining? Uh, I happen to know a very close friend in, 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 in Damascus who is the head of major publishing house. Uh, different subject, though they publish a lot on religious subject. He said two years ago that they used to publish automatically any book in the Arab region, 1,500 copies, automatically. Now they lucky they publish, they print 700 copies. And, uh, and even on, on religious subject. Yes, there is a problem, not only in the Arab land, but also, as you know, here in the USA and other countries, lack of reading. But uh, the number, uh, my emphasis was on science and technology. The number is extremely low, and most of those published were really translation, and hence, there's no innovative things happening in this area. What about the internet? Does that have any impact on people? What, what the, the internet. Yeah, I'm very sure it's, it's a global phenomena, of course, and it's affecting uh, the way they read and they transmit information. But uh, what I'm addressing really goes beyond that is that there is a fundamental problem in the structure uh, uh, of, uh, uh, as, as Dr. Zuel also shed, said, about education. Even our, uh, the children in the Middle East are uh, reared in a authoritarian fashion, and uh, there is a need to expand the horizon, many, many fronts. It's not happening yet. We have one over there. Oh, yeah. um, how much do you think that the influence of um, the Western superpowers in trying to control many things in that area have, uh, how much do you think that contributes to um, decline the, the possibility of, of, of um, success in those countries? Do you think that those, that's only trigger and it only depends on them? Or do you think that the West have had a really bad influence? Uh... Well, as I mentioned, uh, it is a very tragedy, the amount of weapons sold by the United States globally, but especially, as I said, the Arabs are extremely good customers, and they're spending billions of dollars on that, so that's really negative. Uh, in addition, the West in general, not only the US, United States, but England also, big time, uh, they build for them all these silly projects. Uh, I mean, the highest building on earth, uh, claiming, uh, doing many things that are inappropriate. Though at the same time, many uh, important uh, scientific initiatives, as I said, like in Qatar, like Saudi Arabia, King uh, Abdullah University, of course, uh, but these are, as I said, uh, candle of light in a sea of darkness. And, uh, uh, and I, I cannot blame only the West. The, the major problem is with the Arabs. And they, ha uh, they have to change fundamental course. And uh, regardless what you, you say about the Arab Spring right now, it will not solve the fundamental problem. You have to go back the way the society is structured and influenced, and uh, uh, you cannot eliminate Islamic teaching. Uh, so we have to be integral part of the development of the Arab region, but it should be done differently and, uh, and, this, and try to uh, address these issues, which are not right now. Well, what's the percentage of the people that are employed by the energy uh, structure, like oil, gas, and what's the strength of the rest of the economy? It seems like the, the 
when you see the TV and you see that part of the country, they, they don't seem to be employed or busy, you know. They, they, I, I mean, they are uh, in, in rich uh, Arab country oil. There are a lot of uh, employment in the oil sector. In fact, large number of the students studying in the United States eventually end up with oil-related activity, whether chemical or geological or other aspect. Uh, Aramco sent uh, thousands of students for training, for example. And they do have other projects um, uh, within their countries, development project, uh, but there is a fundamental problem. Uh, Saudi Arabia, for example, cannot function one day without the expatriates uh, in Saudi Arabia. This is true for the United Arab Emirates, true for Qatar, true for Kuwait, and the rest of them. You say, what happened to all those hundreds and thousands of PhDs and engineering degree we are producing? Well, they exist, but they are n not being used properly and uh, wisely. There is, there is a popular saying in Arabic uh, that predates oil. Utlubu al-alim wa law Seek knowledge even yeah. if you have to go to China. <laughs> so what is the oil a corrupting uh, influence or what, how do you well, as I said, there are large number of people with university degrees. And I, as I mentioned, one third of them Saudi Arabia and one quarter in Egypt are unemployed. The infrastructure system, whether the political, social, not functioning properly. It's not a simple matter of bringing democracy. The West have to understand that you cannot the same way the Arab cannot import science, and they cannot, the West should understand, cannot export democracy also, the way we understand it. That's not happening. And the easy solution for the West is we want them to be in our image. And, uh, and uh, the policy maker in those rich Arab countries, they want to imitate their masters. Uh, you very nicely pointed out that in the 10th century there was a great era of great wisdom of the Arab population. Uh, this, and you pointed out that this was still while Islam was a very great influence. What caused the change in the subsequent period for the decline of all that kind of uh, intellectual activity in the Arabs? That's very, this is really the heart of the matter. And the, your question is right there. In my opinion, but that's minority opinion, is that, as I said, the misinterpretation of the primary sources of Islam, the Quran and the Hadith, have a lot to do with it. During the Middle Ages, they gradually started to codify and now you hear every day about the word sharia, sharia. But this is uh, not true. If you want to, if you talk to Namath here, and sharia is a making made by human. It's not a doctrine, Islamic doctrine. And uh, the way they codify it, and they solidify it, and they force people to obey certain paths is a major problem uh, that address your concern. That's why there is to a major need to rethink and reinterpret the sources. And that's not easy. You can be hanged for doing this. I think I have to make that the last question. As I say, we're, we're, we're bound by uh, time uh, not, to, uh, not to go over it. She right. said two questions. <laughs> <laughs> you two more? OK, then. I, I saw a hand here, I think. Are you going to make the, your talk available in text format? No. <laughs> <laughs> Is it being recorded? No. Yes, it's being recorded. I don't know what they do with it. I assume they will put it on Cornell. I don't know. But yeah, it's being recorded. 
and Christian. I hope they will put it somewhere. All right. We take one there. Yeah, I, I really think your lecture was wonderful, and I hope that it, it's available to other people yeah. as well. Um, you know, as we all are very concerned about what's happening now in the Middle East, um, I was stunned by the amount of weapons that, um, was it Saudi Arabia, is buying. So when, we, when the U.S. criticizes, let's say, Syria or Iran, you know, there's a dynamics there that I see, like, like when, when you said Saddam Hussein was upset about Kuwait getting the oil from underneath. So, so it seems to me there's almost like, a, you know, something, something's happening here. You know, there are, Saudi Arabia is amassing all these weapons, and then the U.S. is from the U.S., buying it from the U.S., and then we're criticizing these other countries for creating more militarism in their country. I know that's a different topic, and I'm hoping maybe you can speak on that, because... Yeah, there is an element of hypocrisy. Uh, Clinton uh, gave a speech in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, a year and a half ago or so, in which she mentioned about discussing Syria and Iran and lack of democracy there. In Riyadh, she was talking. She should feel ashamed of herself to speak about democracy in Riyadh. I'm afraid we're going to have to close. Thank you.